You're watching Apostolic Radio Charlotte. getting out in the weather and coming to the house of the Lord. Smile at your neighbor. Say, man, I'm glad you're here. All right, find that one person. I'm going to have you. I'm going to pull a vest of mangan here, and I'm going to make you say a bunch of stuff to one person. All right? You get pick one person and tell them this, first of all. Preacher has a message for you today. And the title of that message, which is just for you, is what to try when you're tired of trying. You may be seated. It's a joy to bring the word of the Lord to you today. It's such an honor for me as a minister and as a pastor to have this wonderful group of people to teach and minister to. And uh, every time I stand in this pulpit, it is a great honor that I'm unworthy of. Uh, but the Lord is worth talking about. And the word of God is worth spending some time on. So lend me your quick attention. Let me give a quick compliment to our, our youth. Uh, this is a youth Sunday. And they are leading the worship and praise today. And they do all the music and all the singing. We have, uh, we have, some, uh, we have another special today. We're having the infamous men's choir is going to sing today. <laughs> what to try when you're tired of trying now I want to start out by saying admittedly sometimes we shouldn't be trying and continuing in something that is uh, not good for us that is not going to change represents bad judgment on our part not so much us being a quitter do you understand what I mean by that there are some things where you've done, you've done your best and now it just represents some type of a dysfunction on your part to keep trying. <laughs> it's done. The ship has sailed. <laughs> uh, but in many situations of our life, because they are centered on relationships and people, because they represent family members and loved ones, dear friends, we don't have a choice whether or not we get to quit trying. We have to keep trying. Somebody say, preach it. Preach it. Thank you. I'm not preaching, but I like the idea. And so uh, there are times where you should pray and you should say, Lord, is this something that I'm just in a repetitive rut and I'm really doing nobody any good? I'm just banging my head against the wall, this wall because evidently I don't like migraines very much. Um, so it's something to think about. But for so much of the circumstances and scenarios in our life, we don't have an option of whether or not we're going to quit. We've got to keep trying. We've got to keep pushing. We've got to keep walking. We've got to keep believing. And we've got to keep reminding ourselves that with the help of the Lord, we are going to make it. Um, we, you won't find the word depression in the Bible. The word depression is not in the Bible. But there's plenty of depression in the Bible. <laughs> They just don't call it that. Now, let me real quick define terms because it helps with clarity. Uh, what we refer to today as clinical depression is a real biological issue that represents uh, chemical levels in the com chemical computer between your ears, a.k.a. your brain. And so uh, in, in, in some circumstances when depression is biological, we're not going to fix it with a rah-rah lesson. You understand that. You're going to actually have to work on uh, uh, levels of chemicals. However, um, a lot of what we refer one to another as discouragement, this depression, it's not so much. It's not so much the fact that we have a literal, a, a literal biological problem existing in our brain. Um, it's just we have made bad decisions or poor judgment or we're in trying circumstances, et cetera, et cetera, and we're just dealing with it. We're just making it through. Uh, I like to think of that kind of depression like this. Um, the, the emotional, the non-biological depression where you have a real problem and you need medical help, um, uh, I like to refer to that as you get depression when discouragement meets exhaustion. 
When discouragement meets exhaustion, you are kind of in a despondent uh, ro- circumstance, uh, reality. The word depression is not in the Bible, and incidentally, unless you read the New Living Translation, then it is in the Bible. But um, you will find much discouragement, much exhaustion, and by addition, much depression in the Bible. Um, Hagar, fleeing from the wrath of her mis- mistress Sarah. Uh, Moses, uh, Naomi, Hannah, King Saul, King David, King Solomon, the prophet Elijah, uh, Nehemiah, Job. You're in good company, right? (laughs) The prophet Jeremiah, John the Baptist, greater prophet was never born of woman than John the Baptist. Judas, and as we've learned on Wednesday night, the dear brother, author of two-thirds of the New Testament, Apostle Paul. Um, depression is real, and remember, remember, I've already made a distinction between clinical depression and the kind of stuff most of us deal with on a, um, uh, a regular basis. Uh, the Bible shows poor people dealing with depression, people like Naomi, she's poor, mother-in-law of Ruth, and also very rich people like King Solomon, depressed. Uh, young people like David and old people like Job, all dealing with it. Both women like Hannah and men like Jeremiah, also known as the weeping prophet. Uh, When David and his men reached Ziglag, they found it destroyed by fire and their wives and sons and daughters taken captive. And David and his men wept aloud until they had no strength left to weep. Um, The flip side of that is the despair that comes after a great victory. Saul has just destroyed uh, the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. And now he flees from that, afraid of Jezebel. And he comes to a broom brush, sits down under us and says, Dear God, I have had enough. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. Which is a fancy way of saying I wish I'd have died when I was little. Uh, I will not say Jesus suffered depression. That is a big statement, and I will not say it. But you will find places where he had a weight of heaviness upon him. Matthew 14, when Jesus heard that John the Baptist had been slain, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Uh, I want to remind all of you that if you're dealing with heaviness and uh, exhaustion and despair, uh, God is not mad at you. Your faith may not be where it needs to be, but join the club. Your victory may not be where it needs to be, but uh, come on now, let's get real. God's not angry at you. The preacher is not angry at you, unless you did something to make him angry, which is a whole different problem. (laughs) Uh, Your friends are not angry at you. Your spouse, well, I'm not even going to start on your spouse. She may be angry with you. Uh, But uh, it's real. It's real. Now, we can sing with the choir and dance with the preacher, but it's still real. We can run the aisles and and, and shout with the folks who shout, but you leave it still real. And the Lord will bring us through it. Can I have a big amen? So rather than trying to solve all of these issues of discouragement, exhaustion, and despair, I want to start by reminding you uh, that uh, coping is part of life. And God is with you in the middle of your coping. He's not just with you on your fa- when your favorite preacher's in town. He's not just with you on the good days. He is with you in the middle of the coping. Uh, let me give you a few scriptures that you might remind yourself of and warm your heart by as though you had a cozy fire on this dreary morning. The Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. That's Deuteronomy. How about Joshua? Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Or how about Psalms? The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. 
And he loves to, to save those who are crushed in spirit. Isaiah, so do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed. I am your Lord. I will strengthen you and help you. I will withhold you with my righteous right hand. I love that. Because Paul's just, excuse me, Isaiah's just spent 37 chapters pulling out, pointing out how injustice will not stand and judgment is coming. And then 41, he says, I'm going to uphold you by my righteous right hand. Uh, and so it goes. Goes, Jeremiah, I, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. You will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. Or John, I will pray the Father. This is Jesus speaking. He will give you another comforter that he may abide with you for ever or Matthew Jesus speaking and surely I am with you always. Somebody say yes. I am with you always even to the end of the age. And so in the middle of your coping, in the middle of your tiredness and weariness, uh, we have to walk on. But let's be honest. Depression is when discouragement meets exhaustion. A few things to try when you're sick of trying. The first thing I'd have you try is I'd have you try something you wouldn't expect the preacher to tell you. You would expect the preacher to do what I just did, read a half dozen verses and say, come on, brother, once more into the breach, dear friends. Uh, that's what you would expect. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn the tables on you. And, of course, some of you guys know me by now, and that's not that, ex- unex- uh, that's not that big of a deal to have. But I'm going to give you some real practical stuff, what to try when you're sick of trying. Uh, chances are you haven't been laughing very much. And you're missing one of the great joys of life by not laughing. Uh, the Bible says laughter does good like a medicine. Medicine's a big word. Because medicine is to use reference to something in the practical realm of health. Not just a spiritual encouragement or a boost to your faith. Laughter doeth good like a medicine. Let me give you a few things here on this subject. You know, the Bible was really the first, in my, in my understanding, the Bible is really the first of ancient literature to talk about this principle of laughter being good for you, body, soul, and spirit. Um, and let me give you a few things that science has followed up with. Uh, laughing lowers your blood pressure. Maybe not at the moment when you're screaming with laughter, but very soon thereafter, laughter lowers your blood pressure. Laughter reduces your stress hormones. Uh, Stress hormones can be tested. Some of you guys probably should have them tested because you you really need to make some life changes. That's the truth. Uh, But laughter will reduce your stress hormones. It results in higher immune system function. Not only that, uh, laughter is a great ab workout. And I don't know about you, but my abs could use a workout. <laughs> um, it, it, it is all of these things are positive and a blessing to us. Believe it or not, laughter produces a measurable improvement to your cardio fitness. It has an effect as a cardio workout. And, and I'm not saying you can eat chicken fried steak six days a week and then laugh and think that's going to fix it all. That's not what I'm saying. But I do want you to think about the practicality of having a enjoyment in your life. If you're sick of trying, chances are you haven't been laughing very much. You're not thinking very straight. You're filled with a list of grievances. You're reciting your own personal victim narrative and if you would take a break and have some fun, if you would laugh if nothing else, it would do good like a medicine and it might clear up your perspective on some issues where it's going all fuzzy if you don't want to say amen, at least say ha 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 Laughter boosts your, boosts your uh, T-cell production. T-cells are the cool part, the you know mutant ninja turtles that are in your blood. I have a seven-year-old. And uh, they, they run through your blood, and they look for invaders, and they're like chop, 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 and it's really cool from there. Uh, T-cells are great things to have in your body, and uh, laughter improves that. Laughter triggers the release of endorphins. Endorphins are your body's natural painkillers. By laughing, you release endorphins, which, believe it or not, has clinically been shown... Uh, It can help your perception of chronic pain. It can make you feel better. Uh, Maybe not for all time. The laugh doesn't last for all time, but it is a good thing. The Bible says it doeth good like a medicine. It
it will improve your general sense of well-being. You rank your general sense of well-being after you've had a good laugh, you will tend to rate it higher. There's a lot of things you can't fix in your life. There's a lot of problems you can't solve. Believe it or not, you're stuck in the mud there. But you could influence them all by refusing to live under a personal dark, dark cloud of despair. Learn how to laugh. Is that too practical for you? I hope not. This is life class. And we're wanting to have our lives uh, better, improved, pleasing to God. Uh, the second thing that what I would suggest to you that you should try when you're sick of trying. Remember, I'm defining sick of trying as when discouragement has met exhaustion. You are sick of trying. Uh, again, very practical, but shown to measurably affect uh, your outlook on circumstances. Um, I, if you would get out of your little cubicles of life and you would get outside and take a walk. Boy, I can kill the spirit so fast. It's like a gift. <laughs> uh, get out of your little huddle. Get out of your room. Get out of your rut, find a nature trail, and take a walk, and open your eyes, and breathe the fresh air. The world is much, much bigger than your set of problems. How do the heavens declare the glory of God if you never lift your eyes? Is that fair? Is that fair? How do the heavens declare the glory of God if you spend your life going from one screen to another? I'm imitating you. I'm having fun. Don't get all nervous on me. You know it's the truth. Get away from the screen for a minute. Let the heavens declare the glory of God. Let the wind blow on your sweaty brow. <laughs> Find a nature path. Take a breath. Slow your roll. Spend some time moving outside. Go for a walk. Believe it or not, all creation testifies of things that are bigger than your problems. All creation testifies of a creator who exists high beyond all of our dilemmas. All creation would remind you that God is great and greatly to be praised. This is not just some positive mental attitude. You can see literally positive, measurable, practical, positive, measurable results in people who in the middle of all their stress will go for a walk, will go sit in a park, will take their kids on a nature path. It produces a measurable, practical, medicinal-like effect on their lives, their physical bodies, on their psychological health. Let's be honest. Here is the intersection of where you've been living. Discouragement meets exhaustion. And that's where you've been camping lately. And you've got to try, but you're sick of trying. Life won't let you quit. You've got to keep trying. Life won't let you go tell your boss what you think of him. And if you do, you've just wounded yourself. Life won't let you tell your spouse of how you think they're being self-centered and selfish. I mean, not all the time. I mean, there are those days where the words just have a way of themselves. But if you do it simply to solve an inner pressure problem of your psychological state, you wound yourself. If you always make yourself feel better by lashing out at people near you, you wound yourself. You're like a curse in your own house. Because you manage yourself by transference. You guys have all heard the story about my tree. I called it my cursing tree. Uh, I, I, I ran uh, 
construction company. And any of you guys do construction, it can make you crazy. Um, and I would come home, and some days I would be so upset. And right where I parked my truck, there was a there's a tree right there. And I'd get out of that tree. I'd go I'd go put my I'd go put my hand on that tree, and I I wouldn't cuss cuss, or at least if I did, I'm not going to tell you about it. <laughs> That's none ya. That's none ya business. And everybody I wanted to tell off, I told them off in about 15 seconds, and I'd move to the next one. And you're an idiot, and you're a jerk, and which idiot tree did you fall out of? But if I could leave all that stress and pressure on that tree, I could walk in my house and love my family. Let me tell you a story. After seven years, that tree died. (laughs) You think I'm kidding? I cut it down. It's not there. It died. Better the tree than my family. All right. How much? Good Lord. Third thing I'd have you do that's practical. If you can't escape or manage the negative feelings that you're dealing with. You've tried to manage them. You've tried to escape them. Go ahead and explore them. Go ahead, because you're not getting away from them anyway. They have, they've got a grip on you. They've got an anaconda grip on you. you go, so go ahead and explore them. But don't explore them as an indulgence of yourself or you have a pity party. Explore them, and I want you to be like Sherlock Holmes. I want you to look for three things that are hidden in your negative feelings. The first thing that's hidden in your negative feelings, somewhere in there, there's some lies hidden there. And you're not finding them. You know the old joke, nobody loves me, everybody hates me. It's a lie. But if you, if, you, if you can't get away from the emotion, it is just like a storm. You can't get out of it. Go ahead, admit you're there, explore it. But don't do it for indulgence. Find indulgence. Find the lie that's in the middle of that negative emotion. And then second thing I want you to find that's always hidden in those negative emotions is there are negative assumptions that are incorrect. You have made assumptions They don't like me. No one wants to be my friend. Bad things always happen to me. There are negative assumptions that are hidden in the middle of your storm. And also, there is doubt and fear hidden in there. So if you can't get out of your negative emotion and you have to explore it, go ahead and explore it. But make sure you look for the lies. Make sure you look for the assumptions. And make sure you look for the doubt and the fear that's hidden in those. Don't just explore it as an indulgence. Explore it like Sherlock Holmes and look for the clues. Why? is this this have power over me is that fair all right number four uh what to try when you're sick of trying um you're living you're camping right on the corner of exhaustion plus discouragement uh you need to find your way of being silent your way is not going to be my way but you have a way of being silent The psalmist said it beautifully, and I love the psalmist because he explores the whole gamut of human emotion. Be still, somebody say be still, and know that I am God. We have, we, you have to find your way of being silent. Now, now, uh, there's been a lot of, uh, a lot of people are, uh, instantly nervous that you're promoting, you're promoting Eastern philosophy when you talk about meditation. Um, you know, I don't know when it became popular in the East, but I know the Bible is full of meditation. And uh, it's just the difference of your context, your meditative context. So let me explain. Uh, a lot of, of Eastern philosophy, um, they, 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 they pursue mindfulness, which is the emptiness of the mind. So you literally would concentrate on almost, I mean, you could concentrate on anything as long as it, it did not allow your mind to nervously chase after anything. So you practice mindfulness. Say you're going to concentrate on your breathing. I think that's probably the most popular. Literally, all you let your mind focus on is breathing in and breathing out. So that's their context. They think breathing will help you. And I'm sure it will. God bless them all. I'm not going to have a fight today. But this is what I would rather have you concentrate on. Rather than concentrate on breathing and let everything else out of your mind, I would like you to concentrate on the Word of God and let everything else out of your mind. So, in the same manner, some guru would... (sighs) 
I'm going to say. Blessed is the man who walketh not after the counsel of the ungodly. Nothing else can come in my mind. It's filled with the word. Nor standeth in the way of the sinner. Nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. And into your mind comes, I got to do this, got to do this. No. Push it out. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of living water. Meditation is powerful. Just choose a good context. I would suggest meditate upon the word of God. Uh, find your way of being still. Find your way of being silent. I have my way. I know exactly how to do it. In fact, later on today, <laughs> I'm going to do it. That's my way of being still. What's your way of being still? In that stillness comes refreshing. In that stillness comes a sense of, of, of uh, right weighing your problems, right sizing your problems. Because one of the biggest problems of our, of our life is we take problems out of right context. We, we let small problems grow to an absurd level and we ignore things that really matter. Yeah, now I'm coming down your street, right? Stuff that doesn't really matter. We blow it out to ridiculous proportions. and It becomes this monster that marches through our lives. Uh, and stuff that really does matter, we don't think about it for weeks at a time. We don't, we, it, you know, you don't miss the water till the well runs dry. Stuff that really, really matters. Find your way of being silent. And you will find beautifully, amazingly, that it is restorative to, restorative to you. And I would suggest this. Always, as much as possible, let's, let's, let's be real. As much as possible, include, your, include some form of personal devotion in your way of being silent. Your way of being still. Don't just be quiet and still as a matter of finding rest. But let the presence of the Lord come into that stillness. And the reason why I say that is because you restore your personality, your mind, the seat of your emotions in that quiet place. You will restore that. And that's a good thing. Uh, but you will restore your soul. If you add to that time of silence and reflection, that what your way of being quiet, if you'll add to that some sense of devotion, some sense of the presence of the Lord, if you will do that, you will find it's not just restful to the seat of your emotions, but it is restorative to your soul. Can I have an amen? amen. And finally, 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 uh, I, I would suggest... Uh, if you will make an effort in your life to play. Um, have you ever been around really discouraged people, really depressed people? They don't play. It's like they've forgotten how. They don't play. Now, everybody likes different things. Everybody enjoys different sports. It's all fine and good. I mean, you know, for the most part. Uh, it's, it's restorative, it's good, but if you find people who are really, really living at the intersection of discouragement and exhaustion, you'll notice there is almost no play in their life. Okay? I want to make two comparisons. Remember Jesus said, unless you become as little children. Now, he's speaking in a principled sense. He's, he's speaking kind of in an overarching sense. Unless you become as little children. In other words, there's a simplicity in children. There's a faith that's in children. And we could all learn from that. Um, so, so let me tell you, let, let me draw this comparison. Uh, I, I, I had someone tell me here recently that they don't know how to have fun with children. And I just... I, Honestly, I, I, I didn't say anything ugly, but I, I, was, I almost was just like, oh, did, did I just hear you say that? How can you not have fun with children? That's like saying, I don't know how to drink water. I'm going to give you a lesson on how to have fun with children. Okay, here you go. This is all you need to know. Pick any noun or any verb. A noun is a thing. A verb is an action. Okay, any noun, any verb. Pick them. You pick them. And then at the end, you put the word game. Give me a verb. We're going to play the running game today. And the kids are like, oh, pick me, pick me, pick me, pick me. The running game? What's the running game? And you say, 
Hmm. Deep thoughts for shallow minds. A running game, and you make up a rule. It does not matter. Play is programmed. You pick a rule. It can be anything. We're going to have the, for the first game. You're going to try to get me to run, and I'm going to try to get you to run. <laughs> you say, well, that's silly. Of course it is. I just made it up. I'm under pressure. I've got 300 people here. <laughs> I promise you, if I had a kid up here, we'd have fun. Do you see what I just did? It's silly. It's, that's all you have to have. Now pick any noun. Hat. Now we're going to play the hat game. What's that? Doesn't matter. We're going to play it. <laughs> okay, so now as a principal, over here you have children. They can have fun and play with anything. Now let's take an adult in the middle mile of their life. You know the middle mile? That's probably the one you're in. <laughs> Everybody's excited at the first mile. Everybody's hopeful at the last mile. It's the middle mile. Yes? Let's talk about this adult. This adult, because we live in a wealthy society, is surrounded by toys and entertainment and play opportunities. They have golf clubs in the garage. They have a boat at the lake, theoretically speaking, or access to a friend with a boat. They have a bike in the garage, which they bought in a great effort, you know, to exercise more and thus please their doctor, whatever. They are surrounded by toys, and they're surrounded by entertainment, and they're surrounded by opportunities to play. They could go hiking. They could go to the Whitewater Park. They could do it. They got a million opportunities. Over here you have a child. They need nothing to play. Over here you have an adult staggering under the weight of all their toys, and they still can't have fun. They still can't play. That makes sense. There's some things we could learn from children. If you will fight back against that encampment you have built on the corner of exhaustion meets discouragement, if you will fight back, if you will get out of your rut, if you will pick something and go play, I promise you, it will have an impact on you. It will change something within you. It will change the weather systems of your emotional reality. And in, instead of always just being, I'm sick of trying, I'm sick of work, try to take a moment and remember this. This day of your life is going to pass anyway. You can like it. You can hate it. You can make it good. You can make it bad. You can be positive. You can be negative. Nobody cares. It's passing anyway. You're not getting it back. So why not get the problems in our life that are out of proportion? How about we get them back in proportion? Instead of seeing circumstances as endless deserts of misery, why don't we remind ourselves that it's not the desert's responsibility to make us happy. We have power over our own attitude. We have power over our own spirit. We have, we can make a difference. I can't always put I can't always put anyone in a happy situation, but I can find somebody who is in the exact same situation and they're happy. I, I, on the extreme, I, I think you understand what I mean by that. I know there's extremes of loss and et cetera where that, that, that's just, a, it's different. But I think you understand my intent when I say that. So let's take responsibility, however exhausted we are and however sick of trying we are, let us remi be reminded there's a reason we started this journey. And it's not as bad as our emotions would remind us. And even if it is bad, there are, there's somebody who has faced it and already made it through. And if they made it, we're going to make it. And believe it or not, we're not the prisoner of our negative circumstances. In fact, the only way we could ever have a testimony... Let's all stand. Praise the Lord. Amen.
let's worship the Lord right now. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your presence. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the abundant life you have promised us through Christ Jesus. We need you to help us, Lord, to weigh things in our life with a heavenly view and a heavenly perspective. We need you to help us to walk in a manner where our lives are not just a story of our own making it through, but they're a testimony to others that the promises of God are sure and real and amen. Bless your people, I pray today. Make us strong in this journey. Make us powerful in the word. Make us living, living vessels of, of testimony and victory, I pray. In Jesus' name. And somebody say, in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. We're going to start up service here in just a few minutes. Take a moment. Greet your neighbor. Go to concessions. Get a hot dog. No, I'm just teasing. There's no concessions. Thank you for watching Apostolic Radio Charlotte.